Welcome to your College Bound Kid. A podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. And you want a quality education that deepens your ability to understand people who are different than you are. I am Mark Stucker, and I'm a college coach. And I am Anika Madden, and I am a parent. It is Thursday, December 5th, and welcome to episode number 97, Why is EFC so important? In this week's news, unkept promises, state cuts to higher education threaten access and equity. And we're in chapter 97 of 171 Answers, and we're explaining the expected family contribution, or EFC, and why it's so important. And this week's question asks if they should leave the question about race and ethnicity blank on their college application. And Mark kicks off his interview with Miss Emily Griffin. She's the director of the Loeb Center for Career Exploration and Planning at Amherst College and how you can evaluate and fully utilize a college's career center, part one. Friends, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Anika, what's one thing you're thankful for and how was your Thanksgiving? Uh, let's see. Thankful for life itself in general. No. Um, thankful for this podcast and for you and all that knowledge and that brain. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and for my family. They are kind of darn cool. awesome. What about you? And I think family, family. I'm feeling family right now, you know, especially with the girls away, not at home. You appreciate when everybody can get together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I still have such great memories from my brother and his family from Denver came uh, back last Thanksgiving, we went to Panama City and Beach, and we had Thanksgiving on the beach. He's not coming this year, but he's bought his tickets for New Year's. Aww. So I'm looking forward to that and just family, family, family. And also, like you said, I'm also thankful for our podcast family. And I'm particularly grateful for anyone that has ever communicated with us in any way, whether it was a question, whether it was a comment, whether it was some clarification they sought, anyone who has ever given us a gift. Anyone who has ever rated us on comments on Apple Podcast, anyone who has completed our Your College Bound survey for us, or anyone who's just sent us a general comment. It's the gas and the fuel in the tank. You know, it, I mean, we could just look at stats and obviously we've been growing a lot and that's exciting, but it's stats are kind of bland. You know what I mean? There's no personality there. It's like interaction with real people that fires me up every week. It makes me want to come here excited to share. So, I'm in good mood right now, Anika. All right. Sounds good. All right. Our admissions tip for the week. The admissions tip is love all your list. Love all your list. You know, I had a family this week. They said said to me, I want to find my student. She's like, I really don't know if I should apply to Brown University because I'm not going to go. I'm like, then don't apply. You know, (laughs) (laughs) I just want to see if I'm going to get in. No, no, no. Love all your lists and especially, especially, especially your probables and your safeties. Because a lot of times people are like, yeah, 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 I don't need to have them on there, but I'm not going. No, love all your lists. If you can put yourself in your mind, the mindset of, I've got whatever it is, let's say it's seven schools, it's 10 schools, it's 12 schools, it's five schools, it's four schools, whatever it is, love all your list. And that way you won't be disappointed. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a basic point, but I think it's an important one at this time of year. That's my tip And admissions vernacular. Now, before I share this, I have to tell you a story. This is like good and bad news, Anika. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to, you know how they always say, tell the bad news first and the good news? <laughs> Mm-hmm. I'm going to reverse it. I'm going to do the good news first. <laughs> so the good news is, you remember how I had all that phone trouble talking to you? I finally stopped being on El Cheapo and then dropped some coin and got this new Samsung Note 10 Plus, and I'm loving it. Ooh. So I have a new phone. <laughs> I love it. And just to literally today, I just went over to AT&T and uh, turned in my old one. And so this is hot off the press, fresh news. So the good news is I love my new phone. The bad news is I saved everything I thought, but I had this notes app that I use and I had 130 terms I'd built up in admissions vernacular and I had a zillion tips and I went to pull up my little phone before today because I have my own number and everything. 
That bad boy did not transfer, so I'm back to scratch. <laughs> it's it's all good. It is all good. It'll be fine. But I cried and shed a little tear for a little while. I I built up 130 of those suckers over the last six months, but it's okay. So the admissions vernacular this week is the term MOOC. MOOC is an acronym for a massive open online course and. But around 2013, these were their talk of the town. This is going to transform education. Hasn't really taken off like everybody thought it would, but it's a great opportunity. You know, companies like EDX and Coursera, they offer free courses for you to take with master professors from your computer. And we did talk about one on here a while ago, and I, I talked about the one Eric Ferdin uh, is doing with Stepping Stones on admissions and the admission process. So MOOC, Massive Open Online Course, look it up. Coursera is my favorite place. Just look up Coursera and you'll see a wealth of free courses you can take to expand your knowledge. Now, not all of their courses are free, but a lot of them are MOOC. Love it. College Spotlight. We're going to New Jersey for the first time. Hmm. Seton Hall University. Can't wait to talk about it. Do you remember MOOCs, by the way, Nika, or not? Uh, no. But no? Wait, wait, so MOOCs, are they not from colleges? Are you saying there are these outside companies that are doing MOOCs or college doing MOOCs too? So that's a great question. So colleges partner with these companies because it's their professors. Uh, so it's like a part. Okay. Yeah, so it's like a partnership. The company has like the whole technology and the whole platform. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is like you can take courses, you know, with Harvard professors and Stanford professors and all that for free. Oh, and God. it's a great, great, great way to, I never forget, you know, you know Miss Hull from, from oh, Kip. Yeah. I remember her coming and so excited because she was in one of these MOOCs for free. Mm. She's like, you all need to get in here with the rest of us. <laughs> this is good stuff. Miss Hull. Hey, Miss Hull. Oh, funny. Yeah, it was Hull. <laughs> Sorry, that's a little inside baseball, everybody. We just had to do that. One of our favorite teachers from the past. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. All right. This week's article is entitled Unkept Promises, State Cuts to Higher Education Threaten Access and Equity. And this is found, well, this is from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. It's written by a few people here. This is Michael Mitchell, Michael Leachman, Kathleen Masterson, and Samantha Waxman. So overall, uh, state funding for public two- and four-year colleges and schools Ending in the year 2018 was more than seven billion b- b- billion dollars below the 2008 levels after mm-hmm. for inflation, and so this mm-hmm. article is making the case in how funding has only slightly rebounded for these colleges and universities since the you know the big recession in 2008, mm-hmm. where costs and you know costs are soaring, of course, and services in some of these schools and you know these institutions they haven't returned. So, Mm -hmm. of course, this is especially bad news for low income families, Um, you know, wages, you know, their wages are most vulnerable to loads of debt or they're just unable to afford college altogether. So all in all, Mark, this article is about the need for lawmakers to reinvest in public higher education by increasing Mm -hmm. funding and putting in better financial aid policies. So I'm going to let you just tear all through that guy. But I would be very interested to know what some of these policies could potentially look like. All right. So this is something that we have talked about around the edges, Anika, but we haven't really dedicated a whole article to something that is one of the most important shifts that has occurred. I mean, really, it started occurring as early as the 70s, but it's been escalating and really, really, really taken off since the great, you know, worldwide recession in 2008. And what I'm talking about is the shift between the federal government and the state government seeing it is their responsibility to provide very, very affordable public education for its citizens. That has been seen historically as just a bedrock principle. And if you want to have an equipped and competent adult workforce that's able to compete globally, then you have to invest in them. And invest in them means making public education affordable, both from federal government and state government. That has been chipped and chipped and chipped and chipped away. 
and never like it's we've seen in, in since 2008. And that's one of the biggest reasons, by the way, why you hear about the debt crisis. It's one of the biggest reasons why you've got the $1.6 trillion in student debt. We talked, I think, last week or the week before about the bottomless pit and how you can get parent plus loans and, and you can tap into all of this money. Okay, and that's leading to a debt crisis. But there's another very, very, very important corollary to that, and that is the government, federal and state, walking away from its responsibility. You go back to something like the Pell Grant, founded in 1972. I mean, that, at the time it was launched, it covered almost the cost of attendance, Anika. Mm. You know, now the full Pell Grant is less than 10% of the cost at some schools. So, you know, the core of this article is understanding this shift that has occurred where the cost of college has been passed on from partially to the parent and a substantial portion of it from the state and federal government to now not entirely to the parent and the student, but, you know, overwhelmingly to the student and the student and parent. And so let me, let me read some quotes from the article that jumped out. And just I think the quotes will let people see just how stark this change is that has occurred. And then see if you have any questions for me. Okay. So in the most difficult years after recessions, colleges responded to significant funding cuts by increasing tuition, reducing faculty, limiting course offerings, reducing student services, amongst other cuts, and in some cases, closing campuses. So I just started right with that bang because I want people to see, like, what's the effect of it? Mm -hmm. Well, in addition to just you having to pay more and you either having to work two jobs or, you know, do more advanced savings or take out more debt. I actually want to repeat that because I think that's important. In the most difficult years after recession, colleges responded to significant funding cuts by increasing tuition, reducing faculty, limiting course offerings, reducing student services, among other cuts, and in some cases, closing campuses. The promise to past generations of students in America has been that if you work hard, and strive, public colleges and universities will serve as an avenue to greater economic opportunity and to upward mobility. For today's students, a cohort more racially and economically diverse than ever, that promise is fading. I'm just reading some like of my favorite quotes from the article. This next quote has to do with looking at the number of states and how their funding has changed from 2008 to 2018. 45 of the states spent less money in 2018 than they did in 2008. The only states that spent more were California, Hawaii, North Dakota, and Wyoming. The average state spent 16% less on education in 2018 than they did in 2008. And in nine states, and I'm going to name them, Alabama, Arizona, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina, the drop was more than 30%. So literally, they're spending 30% less in 18 than they did in 08. And of course, costs, everything else is going up. So if you're dropping 30%, you know, that's pretty substantial. In Louisiana, published tuition at four-year schools doubled because that's the other side. So you're spending less. And if you're spending less, then what are you going to do? Well, you're going you're to pass this on to the consumer. So the average published tuition increase at four-year public colleges is up 36% from 2008 to 18. 36% increase. And then in some places, it's up like 40% or even more. A few more things, and then I want to open up to you, Nico, to see if you have any, you know, either comments or questions. Unlike private institutions, which rely more heavily on charitable don- donations and large endowments to help fund their instruction, public two- and four-year colleges typically rely heavily on state and local appropriations. In 2017, state and local dollars constituted 54% of the funds these institutions use for instruction. So once again, public schools are the ones that get hit the hardest because they don't tend to have the large endowments mm-hmm. to back them up in the way certainly wealthier schools do. And then there's a chart in this article that shows the states that had where higher education remains far below the pre-recession level. So the percent change in spending per student, because that's the other thing, you're decreasing how much you're spending per student. So Arizona, they 
are now spending 55.7% less money on each kid than they were in 2008. 55.7. Louisiana, it's 40.6. And then the other ones that are over 30% less would be Pennsylvania, Oklahoma, Alabama, Mississippi, New Mexico, South South Carolina. And so drastic, drastic, drastic cuts. So you've got the combination of cutting funding while you simultaneously increase tuition. Uh, I'm just going to take a breather for a second. You can see if you have any, you know, any thoughts. Yeah, yeah, actually I do. So, you know, I zeroed in on North Carolina's percentage and how much they increased. And it wasn't quite Mm -hmm. double, but it was darn near close to it, around 36% or something like that. So Mm -hmm. when they talk about, Okay, so we know all these things have happened, but as a family, we're, you know, we're applying, we're doing what we're supposed to do on our end, but how do we know what that translates, how that all translates into the kids' experience when they get there, specifically like the Mm -hmm. course offerings? Like, how do I know that my child is being limited in their course offerings? Like, how do I know that? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think one thing that I think people don't spend enough time doing, and quite honestly, I don't think we've spent enough time talking about it on this podcast, is looking at a college's financials Mm -hmm. and looking at a change in their financials. And you can expect, and you can pretty much take it to the bank, Anika, that if a school has decreased enrollment, then there's going to be cuts that are going to be coming. So everybody should be sort of watching the schools that you're applying to. You should be looking at two things. You should be looking at the number of attendees, number of students, because most schools are tuition driven. And so how many people are there compared to the last few years? Mm -hmm. You see downtrends, that is not a good sign. Because if there's a downtrend, that's less money. And that less money means things are happening. You may not be able to see what, you're not always going to be able to see that they put out a memo to the faculty saying that they were laying off, you know, 20 or 30 faculty members or percent of faculty, or you're not going to see that they're freezing salary increases for the fifth year in a row. Like the public won't necessarily see all those things. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to see, but there's two things that you can look at and you should look at. And one of them, as I mentioned, is your enrollment trends, which for you is a good thing, actually, where you work at A&T, you guys are up, but a lot of other schools are not. And the other thing that people need to look at, and this is a little trickier because you have to actually look at the school's financials and look up their financial statements, but it's what we call net tuition revenue. And it's, we've talked a little bit before about tuition discounting and tuition discounting, of course, is if a school costs $50,000, but in actuality, they're really getting $25,000 for each student, then they have a 50% discount rate. And the tuition discount rate, that lets you know, okay, I mean, really, the amount of money you have for the most part is going to be a combination of how much are you discounting off the real price and how many people you have there. Mm. Now, for schools like Pomona and Princeton and Rice and Richmond and Stanford and Amherst, schools with large endowments, this doesn't apply because schools like that get between 25 to 50 percent of the money for their operating budget from their endowment. But more than 95 percent of schools are tuition driven. And so there's a, those are two things that you really want to look at for schools that you have in mind, and that will let you know. And if you see a downward trend in both of them, that is going to be an extremely dangerous sign. That's going to be a buyer beware, hmm. risky, risky, risky. It's going to be very hard for you to know the question you asked, Anika, like, how is this going to impact me? Right. Because they're not going to advertise, guess what, you know, we... We decided that we are dropping four or five courses that we used to teach in name your favorite department, whatever, in the economics department, right? And we're laying off certain faculty. You're not going to know that when they free salaries. Remember, we talked about this last week. 75% of a college expenses are tuition, are faculty and administration salaries and benefits. Mm -hmm. So when a school wants to go after money, they're typically going to go after something to do with salary and compensation and benefits for staff and administration. That's where we're going to see a lot of the cuts. But you're not going to know that, yeah, when you freeze salaries for the fifth year in a row or you pass significant aspects of health care onto your faculty and your administrative and your staff, and, you you know, they find out that they got to pay an extra whatever, mm-hmm. $2,000 a year in health care, like that leads to people leaving. Hmm. 
Hmm. So yeah, did I answer the question? Yes or no? Oh no, yeah, absolutely you did. And I'm, okay. I'm just I'm also just stuck on those courses. Like, how do I know my kids not getting something they should be getting? And I was just thinking through, like, you know, one thing that Janae's counselor told her now is that she really needs to be focused on what her graduate program is going to be looking for. Like she, you know, now's the time to prep for, you know, whatever courses and whatever they need. Right. So I, mm-hmm. I just wonder if there's a way that I can align and say, OK, I need a lot of this at my undergraduate program, but I can go out in the community and get that. I mean, I know that's, you know, drilling into the weeds, but I don't know. My brain is just going there right now. Well, this is. Let me answer it this way. It's not completely answering your question, but I think it may be helpful. This is why I love to talk to students. Talk to students at the school in the program. Talk to alumni. This is why I love to read school newspapers, Mm -hmm. okay? If you start talking to recent graduates, current students about their department, about changes in the department, about their experience there, and newspaper, and you read newspapers. This is, you know, school newspapers. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Um, you can read that too, by the way. You know, don't forget the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Got, got to shout out the AJC. Sorry, I digress. But, you, you know, this is where you can kind of get that pulse on the ground. This is another reason, by the way, why I encourage people to read course catalogs. Look at the courses that are offered. Right. Look at the courses that are offered and compare them to, uh, to the schools that you, you know, look at. Also, look at the sizes of the number of, you can look at that. You can get that information right off of collegedata.com. It tells you the number of classes that are at various levels of enrollment, you know, so you can see how many classes are under 10, under 20, under 50, over 100. All that stuff is in there. So there are things that you can do, both subjectively talking with people and objectively numbers, data research, to get a feel for it. Okay. But what you were asking me, I kind of feel was a little on and almost outside the scope of this. You were almost saying, like, what do I need to do to prepare for grad school? Well, that's what it well, sounded like you were saying. Well, kind of, sort of, but yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just thinking about the impact, right? Like, what does this mean? What do all these cuts and you know all of this recession and taking stuff away and never coming back? What does that mean for the schools that I'm looking at? Like, how do I know what I'm getting into essentially? Yeah, and you've pretty much covered that, but you, you've covered that. I think so. Yeah, I, I would say because, you know, first time listeners, Anika's daughter, Nea, she wants to be a vet. So Anika's looking at things a lot of times from that standpoint. Mm-hmm. So with that, you want to talk to to vet schools and you want to find, you know, ask them what they're looking for. And then if I go back and evaluate your program and see how well they prepare for that right. and do it and work it backwards. One place where you will see it if you are on the inside of a school is if you have a high faculty turnover. Or if you can't get the faculty you want because your compensation plan is weak. Slowly learning between you and my good friend Dave who listens to every episode and gives me feedback. Not do information overload. (laughs) And I know that laugh means, yeah, because you need to learn that, buddy. I know exactly what that laugh. You remember you used to to tell me that all the time in our first episodes. You're like, you did information overload again. I don't know if you just got tired of telling me or I improved incrementally. Mark, Dave, you hear my fist bump. Thank you. Fist bump, Dave. (laughs) Okay, fist bump in the air. (laughs) So I'm resisting the urge because there's so much more in this article, you know? Talks about how Louisiana, I mean, the change in tuition. Okay, I'm sorry. I gotta I gotta say this. I can't resist. (laughs) So the change in tuition at certain public schools between 2008 to 2018, because of these changes, Louisiana, Nika, 105% increase. Arizona, 91% increase. Mm. All right. And then several others, really, really high, including Georgia, by the way. Yeah. And so, yeah. So once again, passing the cost on to us because states are walking back the cost. Now, in some cases, it's a combination of their lack of commitment to education. Because one of the things you can tell with any school, and it's true for us individually in our own lives, as well as for families, look at your budget and you can tell me your priorities. I mean, that right out of the Bible, you know, where your treasure is, your heart is also Matthew, right? And it's the same true for schools. Like, I love to look at schools' budgets because I can tell right away what your priority is by looking at your budget. Mm. And so some of this is a, I mean, you look at states. Why is it that some states have increased and others have not? Part of it is a reflection of the priority of one state versus another to education Mm. versus others. But part of it also is the fact that when you have less money in the coffers, 
Do you know what I mean? Things are going to start getting tight. Yep. Anyway, I think we covered enough without me going back and go, venturing into information overload territory. Although I probably already did it anyway. <laughs> Good job. Now it's time for our step-by-step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Okay, friends, we are talking about a really important concept to understand really how money works when it comes to college. And it's the concept of EFC. And so this chapter, the 97th chapter in the book I wrote, and this segment of our podcast, we take a couple excerpts from every chapter in this book I wrote called 171 Answers, is what is EFC and why is it important? Anika, you read the chapter. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts, reflections, comments, questions? What do you think? Well, let me tell you what I learned, which I kind of sort of knew before, but So the EFC, Expected Family Contribution, it is the federal government's formula. This is the amount of money that they determine, they say is how much your family is expected to pay annually for college, period. It is determined after you complete the FAFSA form, the EFC is sent on what they call the Student Aid Report, the SAR, and that there are eight factors that are used to determine the EFC. So do you want to chime in or you want me to go into those eight or what you want to do? Yeah, let me make some general comments about EFC that are really, really important because I really want our listeners to understand this. And then let's come back to the eight biggest factors that determine your EFC. Okay. So first of all, I hate this term EFC. Hmm. I mean, I can't stand it. And the reason why I can't stand it is because EFC is just an acronym, right? It's an, an acronym for expected family contribution. But the reason why I I don't like it is because it's so confusing. And the reason why it's confusing is because, and we're going to talk about the criteria that determine what your EFC is. But once you know what your EFC is, Anika, that rarely will let you know what a college is going to ask you to pay. Mm -hmm. So when you hear the term expected family contribution, I think, okay, how much do I need to cough up? What's my contribution? How much do I have to pay? But that's actually not the way it actually works in the real world. You know, in the real world, first of all, expected family contribution is a number. It's true that it is a number that the formula believes you should be able to pay. But remember how we've said many times, Anika, there's only about 70 colleges that meet full demonstrated need. So those are the only ones that actually are using the EFC to figure out what you actually have to pay. Mm, Gotcha. So in reality, there's a disconnect between what your EFC is and what you're actually asked to pay. Now, where EFC does come in and it becomes important is it lets you know the amount of need-based aid that you're eligible for, not likely to receive, but eligible for. Remember last week, Nico, you were saying, and we were talking about the qualifications to receive federal aid, and one of them is you have to have a financial need, and you're like, what do you mean? Everybody's got a financial lead unless it's a millionaire applying to a community college. Right. And no, they don't because it's going by this formula. According to the formula, do you have a need? And I want to remind people again because you really have to understand this formula to understand how financial aid works. It's a basic formula, just like two plus two is four. And that is cost of attendance minus EFC equals your family's need. And so if the EFC, which by the way, EFC does not change Because the cost of the college changes. Your EFC will stay the same from one school to the next. Now, there is one exception, and this is where it gets really complicated. And I really want to make sure that we explain this. Do you remember how I talked in the chapter about two types of EFCs, Anika? I talked about federal methodology and the institutional methodology, Mm -hmm. FAFSA versus profile. Right. That's very important for people to understand. And so I want to spend a a little bit of time on it. Okay. The FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid, when you complete a FAFSA, you get something called a student aid report. And on that student aid report, it will have your EFC. That is formula driven. And it would be the same for every single school that uses the FAFSA for financial aid purposes. But the FAFSA is is about federal financial aid. There are another 187 other schools that require an additional form. We call it the profile. It's just short for the CSS profile. College Scholarship Search Profile is another thing run by the College Board. 
Okay, by the way, you're going to see people say there's 300 schools, there's 350, there's 250, 200. I get tired of reading how many different times people say how many profile schools are out there. There's 187. I've counted them. Okay, maybe they, <laughs> I literally counted them. I'm sorry, I did. I know I'm anal. I know. But the reason why you'll hear people say there's 300, there's 250 is because people are double counting. Like so take, for example, Columbia. Columbia is listed under the profile in literally six different ways. There's Columbia College of Engineering, Columbia College of Dental Medicine, Columbia Occupational Therapy, Columbia Physician Surgeons, Columbia School of the Arts, and Columbia Law. So it's one. Those, those have different what we call CSS profile codes, but those don't constitute different schools. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing about the profile is it uses a very, very different methodology than the FAFSA uses. And we're going to do a whole deep dive on the profile in episode 108. So I don't want to get into profile methodology right now. But the one thing I do want people to understand is this, that the FAFSA is about the federal methodology by the federal government, by the Department of Education, and it will be exactly the same. Your EFC will not change from one school to the next. Schools that use the profile are wealthier schools that have a lot of their own institutional money. And if they're going to give their money away, they want to make sure they give it to the right people. The FAFSA has all kinds of problems in the methodology. It's not that accurate. And the profile attempts to be much more accurate. It basically blocks all the loopholes that people have where they try to get around the FAFSA. And the thing about the profile that's confusing to people is you don't find out from a profile school. Like Davidson is a profile school where you work A&T is a FAFSA school, Anika. Mm -hmm. You don't find out from your profile school what your EFC is from that school. It's a different EFC for every single school because with the profile, they apply different criteria differently. And that's all I'm going to say on that now because I know we're talking about it in episode 108. But that's confusing for people. So literally, you know, if you apply to five different schools that accept the profile, they will have a different EFC for you depending on their own individual methodology. So that's the one thing I want people to understand is that there are literally two different EFCs for most of the schools in the country that take the FAFSA only. And then for these other, you know, 6% of schools that take the profile. So any questions on that at all? Mm -mm, Because, you know, we did. Well, as you mentioned, we did went through that. So, yeah. What do you mean we went through that? What are you trying to say? No, no, no. saying a bunch of stuff I don't need to say? No, 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 no. no. Oh, Just, personally. You mean personally. Yeah, personal, yeah, personal question. Okay, no, okay. No, I'm covered. Sorry, folks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Nika, our listeners don't know what you're talking about. You're talking about for your own, for Jalen. He had to go so through that. Selfish. Yes. So selfish. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I need to take you back sometimes. It's not only the Anika world here. It's the whole <laughs> the whole world listening, Anika. It's not our private session. <laughs> yeah. No, At I least you own that. it. At least you own it. I do think it's clear, though. <laughs> so that's important, right? The, what it stands for, what it means. Now, I'll tell you where EFC it has become extremely important. So for low-income and modest-income families, for approximately the bottom 40% of families, from an income and asset standpoint, families and income. Because the federal methodology is used to determine the Pell Grant, which is free money, then that becomes very important. And it's just a fixed form that if you qualify for it, if your student aid report comes back and it says that you have an EFC, oh, I used to remember it exactly to the penny, but it's something a little bit under 5,800. If it comes back and it says like, you know, 5,788 or something like that, then you're going to get some free money from the government. Mm-hmm. that is fixed and that doesn't change. So for really low-income families, that this becomes very important because that's fixed. But for most people, just because you know your EFC, yeah, it will tell you the maximum amount of aid that you're eligible to receive, but it rarely will tell you how much money you are going to receive. And most people are more concerned with what they're going to receive versus what they're eligible to receive. All right. Anika and I are so grateful for everyone who has financially supported our podcast. It allows us to pay our staff and cover our other auxiliary expenses involved in having a weekly professional podcast. At the start of every month, we're going to start sending a special gift to anyone who financially supports your college-bound kid. I will be sending our donors this bonus content once a month directly to your email. The bonus content will be between 10 to 15 minutes in length, Usually it would be a college-related topic that I'm passionate about. The 
Occasionally, it'll be another bonus hot topic in the news segment. Sometimes it'll be an answer to a question that one of our listeners submits to us via email. And you'll receive these monthly audio blogs for a gift of any amount. We know that 5000 to one person is $5 to someone else. And we don't want your budget to be a hindrance to you receiving this additional bonus content. So if you want to support our show, just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and click the donate button. And if you've already financially supported our podcast, you will automatically start receiving this bonus content via your email. This bonus content is our way of letting our financial supporters know in a tangible way how much we appreciate you. And if you have any questions at all about our monthly bonus content, just send your questions our way. That's to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Once again, questions at your collegeboundkid.com. All right. Having said that, let's jump into the different criteria that determine what your EFC is. And if you remember from the chapter, I broke it down according to the factors that carry the most weight Mm -hmm. versus ones that don't carry as much weight. Why don't you take that away for us? All right. So I didn't realize this one carry. Well, and just clarify, because you did list this one yep. first, being dependent yep. or independent is what you listed yep. first. But I was surprised because I thought you would have listed parent income first. OK, so they're both extremely important. And we have a whole segment coming up versus what's a dependent versus independent. So I don't want to go into detail on it other than I'll say this. If somebody is considered classified as an independent then their parents' financial information does not have to be shared. Mm. So that's how it, so it's related to income, right? Right, right. So it takes income, yeah. So because an independent shields the parent income, it has a huge factor in in EFC. Okay. And then the next one being the number of college students in the household was number three. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I'm doing here, we're talking about the major, major factors that influence EFC in a substantial way. Whether you're dependent or independent has a huge bearing on your EFC. And parent income, huge bearing on your EFC. And then number of kids in college. And the reason for that is because how are you supposed to come up with money if you don't have it? Like if you're already paying thirty or 40000 for one kid, then it decreases your discretionary money. Right. And it does it in a way that the federal government, as well as the profile, says this is completely legitimate. I mean, you got one kid in college. How can we expect you to come up with all this money when you got a kid in college? Okay. And then, so the next one would be student income, if the student's been working, I guess. Yeah. So student income can impact EFC a lot, but we talked about this a little bit in the past. There's something called a uh, student income protection allowance. It's around $6,800. And so the first $6,800 is shielded. It doesn't change the EFC. But once you start making more than that, it takes 50% of every dollar above that figure. Mm. So student income normally doesn't impact EFC a lot, but it does impact EFC a lot if you've got a student that makes a lot of money. Okay. I don't know how common that is, but... (laughs) Well, Anika, I'm working with a student right now. He works... Now, he's a senior in high school, but he wants to continue to doing, do this in college. Hmm. But he has a job working at, like, downtown Atlanta. Like, he does, like, one of those things where, he, like, a parking lot attendant, you know, mm-hmm. where you park. And he makes $15 an hour. Hmm. And he's working 30 hours a week. Oh, wow. Yes. So he's making four fifty a week. So if you, you know, if you multiply that out, like he's on pace to make about eighteen to 20000 I have another student I work with who works at uh, Panera Bread, and he works 30 hours a week. And I had to stop him because this student is in college. And I had to say, do you realize how little of this you're going to actually see? Mm. You know? So, yeah, so that happens where people work a lot of money. And then once again, but keep in mind, If a school is not going to meet your full financial need, then you can go over on EFC. It doesn't mean they're going to give it to you anyway. Wow. Okay. So five and six are parent assets and student assets. Right. So just to take a step back, EFC's formula is basically boils down to parent income, student income, parent assets, student assets, and number of kids in college, and whether you're dependent or independent. That's really it. So assets... They don't impact EFC as much as you would think because of the fact that your primary house where you live does not go into the formula and your retirement accounts do not go into the formula. And even when you have money that does go into the formula. So, Nika, what would that be if it's not your primary residence Mm -hmm. and it's not your retirement accounts? 
what would be assets? What would be assets that would go into the formula? I'm thinking stocks and bonds and... Yes. Uh, I don't know. What else? What Cash. Else? Yeah. So savings accounts, checking account, money market account, stocks, bonds, additional rental properties. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 529 savings accounts, trust funds. I mean, it's really... Is what people think of as your net worth plus college accounts. It's probably a simple way of putting it. Okay. And so um, but most people have their money in their home mm-hmm. and in their retirement account. So those two things do not count in the asset formula. Those are the two biggest ones for most people. I mean, not that many people are like sitting around with like seven figures in the bank, mm-hmm. you know? Now, wealthier people have a lot of stocks outside of retirement. But the average person doesn't. Mm-hmm. So that's why assets don't impact the formula that much. And the other reason why they don't is because it still only takes 5.64% of your assets. So let's say someone has $100,000 in the bank outside of retirement accounts and outside of their home. Then that would increase their EFC by $5,640. Hmm. Okay, so interesting that you list the final two as modest impact, you know, the way you frame Correct. those. So Correct. you have number of dependents in the home and the age of the oldest parent both have modest impact. What do you mean by that? So you would think, and this would be surprising. So you would think, okay, let's say it's a single mom with one kid. So there's two people in the home, right? Mm-hmm. And let's say another situation is a family with five kids, family of seven versus two in the home, right? you would think that that would drastically change the formula. Because remember, the formula is trying to get at what is fair. Mm -hmm. It's trying to get at what is fair. So yeah, of course, the more dependents you have in the home, the more you can have a higher income and play lower EFC. But it doesn't make as big of an adjustment as you would think is what I'm trying to say. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, the amount to which it impacts EFC is more modest than substantial. Now, in that example, it's going to be real, quite noticeable, seven compared to two. But if it's two compared to three, it's really incremental, the difference it makes, or even two compared to four. Like, to me, they should rechange those tables in a way where they give you a lot more credit for having an extra person in the house because it, it increases your expenses a lot, but that's not necessarily reflected. Listen, I'm going to talk about this next week, and I'm trying to not venture into next week. We're kind of doing a two-parter on EFC. Because next week, we really literally get into why in the world does my EFC say that I can pay this amount of money, Mm -hmm. you know? And that's what we're going to deal with, like why EFC formula is jacked up and bogus, basically, (laughs) is really, really, really inaccurate. And I'm going to talk about why it's inaccurate next week. I'm trying to avoid that this week. I'm trying to kind of stay in my lane. But okay, but you're going to touch on the age of the oldest parent? Yeah. Yeah. So the reason why, yeah, because I know that's that's surprising. Like, what does the age of the oldest have? Yeah, like, I remember like, you talking about it. I just can't remember. I'm like, what in the world does this have to do with this? So there's a few reasons why the age of the oldest parent impacts EFC. It used to be a lot more than it is now. There's something in place known as an asset protection allow. It looks at the age of the oldest parent, and it shields a certain portion of your assets that don't even go into the formula at all. And the oldest parent is the more money that it shields and protects. And the thinking is for that is that you're closer to retirement. And so you need to be able to use some of the money that you have to live off of because you don't have as many able-bodied years to work and make a lot of money. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. So the reason why it's different is because they're basically phasing out this asset protection allowance. And you go like, when I did my Game Changer 10-hour college admissions video series in 2014, a 50-year-old would have about $50,000 of your assets just completely protected. So the first, not only do they not look at your home, your primary home, and not only did they not look at your retirement, but the first 50,000 of assets didn't even count toward the formula. Hmm. Now I looked at the new tables, that new number now is around 10,000 is shielded. So it's gone from like, they're phasing it out. They've gone from 50 down to about 10,000 in the last five years. So this, it's a minor factor. By the way, I really want to say something. So when I say your home is protected, that is your primary home. One thing that does get people in trouble is when they have a lot of rental properties. Right. That will jack up your EFC really fast, especially if they're, you know, if you now, if you're upside down on them, if you, you know, it doesn't just look at you on properties, how much are they worth? It looks at, it looks at how much are they worth versus what's your mortgage still on them. 
I'm working with somebody now and they call me and they are freaking out because they found out that they're going to have to, their second property was going to count as an asset. And they were, they were really concerned. And then when we looked at the numbers, it turns out that there's not that big of a difference between how much the home is worth and how much they still owe on the home. Mm-hmm. So it ended up being like a really minor factor. So with additional properties, it's what's your equity, not just like what is the value of the home. All right. I think we got into the weeds a lot. I don't know if this might have been boring to people, but I do want people to understand this because if you're applying and you're looking to get need-based financial aid, not merit-based, need-based financial aid is based off of the EFC, period. You know? Mm -hmm. Now, once again, it doesn't mean you're guaranteed to get the difference between the cost of attendance and your EFC because the school still has to have the money for it. But the only way you get need-based money is if your EFC is less than cost of attendance. All right. Next week, we're going to stay tuned for part two. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right. Our question this week is from a student in Delaware. And their question reads, should I leave the question about race and ethnicity blank in my college application? And I don't have any more context to that, Mark. So I don't know if they shared more with you or not. No. So, so, you know, when you, when you, let's just use the common app because 900 colleges and most famous app in the country. So when you go on and you start to fill out your common app and you go into your common at main questions, there's a demographic section. And first thing it does, it asks you religious preference and there's a drop down. You can pick Baptist and all that up there. And then asks you about U.S. armed forces status. And then it asks, are you Hispanic or Latino? Okay. And then after that, it asks you, you know, the following question. It says, regardless of your answer to the prior question, meaning about a Hispanic and Latino, because people think that's a racial category when it's not, It says, please indicate how you identify yourself. And this is the question. And this is on, you know, every application. And then it says you may select one or more. And then it gives you a choice. It gives you American Indian or Alaskan Native, Asian, Black or African American, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, or white. And it says you may select one of two. And then it has a little bit of a note at the very end of this, because this is toward the end of the demographic section of, of the Common App. And it says, the questions in this section, while helpful to colleges, are entirely optional, and you're welcome to move on without answering them. Before you do, please confirm for us that you've completed this section to your satisfaction. You just have to check a box and move on. So that's the context. And so what are your thoughts on this, Anika? Because we've kind of touched on this once before. Yeah, I wondered if it was because they were mixed race and they felt like one may benefit them more than the other. I don't know. So from my experience, when people ask this question, they're fearful that the way they're going to answer it will not advance their case for getting in. It's the way most people talk to me. Like I did a session today with somebody from New York and we're going over a number of college specific questions and he would say, you know, read the question to me. And he would say, how should I answer that? And I would, and I would say to him, well, what's the truth? What's your experience? And, but, you know, people are approaching it. In other words, like, what do they want to hear? That's how people think about this. Like, Mm. what do they want to hear? And if I'm going to put down what I think they may not want to hear, then I don't know if I want to do it because I think it may not help me. And I know if you remember, it was not that long ago, maybe 15 episodes or so ago, we had a question from someone, like you said, that was mixed race there, I think maybe Asian and Caucasian. Hmm. And they wanted to know how they should list themselves. And at the time, the way I answered that was, this is a very important part of who you are, your identity. And you need to be comfortable with in your own skin and share your own identity the way you feel versus try to game the system. And if a college doesn't want you for who you are, then do you really want to front? Remember I used the example, like, do you really want to put on like high heels and makeup and everything and make yourself up to be different than who you are just to get into college? Right. You know, if a college doesn't accept you for who you are, then that's probably not the college for you. But I want to kind of come in it a little bit differently this time. Everything I said before still stands. But I want to actually read a quote. I, I can't tell you who said this because I just don't think 
they would want me to say it. But this is a quote that came from someone from a very, very highly selective school when they were asked this question. This is pretty recently. And I want to tell you how they answered it. And then I want to kind of go into this. Okay, here's what they said. I think a lot of people are suspicious and think, why did you ask me that? Why do you want to know? If I ask you, then I want to know. And part of why I want to know is so I can understand your context. Trust me, I don't ask you to write extra things for fun. I ask you because I actually want to know. I'm trying to get an idea of who you are. Now, this is important. So hiding that from me because you think I won't like your answer is not going to help you. So use the space and tell your truth. Now, that was an incredibly transparent answer from an admission officer. Any thoughts on that, Anika? Uh, think how deep that was. I mean, <laughs> yeah, he's, I don't know. I'm kind of speechless, clearly. So the reason why I wanted to bring this up is for several reasons. Sometimes admissions can be very PC and very politically correct. That person just told it the way a lot of people really think in college admissions. Now, even at the bottom of the common application, Anika, that little statement I read, I'm going to read it again, is kind of being PC. But if you read between the lines, you can get it. You can see what they're getting at. So this is what it says at the bottom. The questions in this section, and remember, this came right after the question on race and ethnicity, right? The question in this section, while helpful to the colleges, don't forget that, while helpful to the colleges, don't miss that, then it says are entirely optional, and you're welcome to move on without answering them. So what I want to say here is, while technically that's true, a lot of people are going to feel the way that admission officer shared. When it says, while well, helpful to the colleges, you're not doing something that is helpful to the colleges by boycotting that question. Now, I know some people just feel really strong in a matter of principle. It shouldn't matter what I am, this, that, the other, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, I've worked with a lot of people that feel that way. Why does what I am matter at the school? That's well, And some people feel very, very strongly about that. I'm not saying if you feel really strongly about that, that you should not skip it. I'm not saying that because this is your personal identity we're talking about, and that's something very real to you. But what I am saying is you should be aware that there are a sizable number of colleges, especially at highly selective schools, that will take you skipping that question as you not being comfortable with who you are. And to reread what I said before, I'm just going to read that last part again because I thought that was pretty profound, the thing you said. Trust me, I don't ask you to write extra things for fun. I ask you because I actually want to know. I'm trying to get an idea of who you are. So hiding that from me because you think I won't like your answer isn't helping you. Use the space and tell your truth. So there will be, I, you know, I'm not going to say everybody because admissions is so individual and what one person does can be very different from somebody else. But there are a sizable number of people that will feel like, you know what, you just showed me that you're not kind of comfortable in your own skin, that you didn't feel comfortable answering a question that we asked you. And I think that some people think that they're helping themselves by skipping that question. And they actually may be not helping themselves because they may be signaling that they're not comfortable in their own skin. Look, this is not the most important thing compared to all the other aspects of your application. But what do you think, Anika? I want to put it out there. I want to get some thoughts from you. No, I mean, I, I think I've already spoke not. <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, mostly because I, I just can't relate to that space. Like, I can't relate to being in that position where I have to disguise my identity or you right. know, question what I need to say about myself. Like, that is just completely uncomfortable for me. And I just can't imagine being there. So that's more so where my sp stammering is come, you know, coming from. So the places where I see this the most are when I work with either Caucasian students or Asian students. Mm -hmm. They're the ones I see the most. And their thinking is that they're not a student of color 
They're not bringing diversity. And therefore, is it going to either... So many times when I work with Asian students, Anika, like to the majority of the times, I would say more than 80% of the time. And I don't know if you know this, Anika, but my students that I work with outside of my school job, they're almost, I was looking at them the other day, they're very close to being equal between white, black, Latino, and Asian. It's almost a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. It's crazy how it worked out that way, at least for this year. So I'm working with like large numbers of Asian students, large number of Latinx students, large number of white and black, and not very many internationals. But the overwhelming majority of Asian students that I work with, they come in to the conversation saying, I know that it's a double standard for me. I know it's harder for me to get into certain schools than it is for other people. And how is that going to impact things? Like, that's a common question. They're just upfront about it. And I have to push back with them and say, well, that's not always true. It's a lot of factors that determine whether that's true or not. Like some schools are not looking at that at all. Some school, in some cases, it is. In some cases, it is an advantage. I had a highly selective school tell me very recently that that um, Asian females that apply early decision to us, we love them, we gobble them up, and we take them because when we see that exact same kid in the regular round, we usually don't get that kid. So I think sometimes it's a misunderstanding. Um, but sometimes, you know, that's out there. And of course, we have the Harvard lawsuit and all that. So that's a lot of the background where people are coming from. They're coming from feeling like being white or being Asian is going to hurt them in the college admission process. And so why should I tell them that? Because it may hurt me. Hmm. Does that at least explain it? Mm-hmm. You know, but be who you are. And if people don't want you for who you are, then that's not the school for you. But I just want to bring out that side of it. Okay, friends, you're in for a real treat in my interview with Emily Griffin. This is the first of three parts. We're doing something we haven't done in a long time. We're actually looking at services offered at a college and how you can utilize them. Today's the Career Center. If you are a college student, this relates to you as a freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior. But it also relates to you if you're a high school student as well, because we're going to talk about how to evaluate career centers. And how do you know if a career center is good and whether it's going to help you get a job or not? So I think this is a really, really exciting interview. Emily was delightful. Listen and enjoy. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, I am here with Emily Griffin of Amherst College in Amherst, Massachusetts. Welcome to the Your College Bound Kid podcast, Emily. Thank you. Friends, let me tell you how I met Emily. So some of you may remember about four months ago, I actually said on the podcast that we want to have some more interviews about how to excel once you're actually in college in 2020 with people like academic success centers, career services, disability services, et cetera. And Matt, who's the director of admissions at Amherst, he was listening to that particular episode. So he shot me an email afterward. He said, Mark, I've got the perfect person for you, Emily Griffin. She runs our career center. And not only is she highly skilled at her job, but she is a tremendous communicator. So then Emily and I talked and I agreed she's a tremendous communicator. So she's our guest today. No pressure there, Emily. (laughs) <laughs> None taken. <laughs> so before we dive into our topic for the day, we want to know a little bit more about you, Emily. So take a little time. Tell us about your upbringing, your education, family, work experiences, really, honestly, anything you kind of want to share so that we know who we're listening to. Sure. There's always the long version and the short version, right? So I'll try to land in the middle. Yes, the middle would be great. Great. Well, I spent most of my childhood and teenage years in Westchester County, uh, which is the suburbs just outside of Manhattan, and uh, didn't really love growing up there. But as soon as I was old enough, I was able to revolve my life around New York City, which was really great. My family is very art-centric. Both my parents really care about the arts. There are a lot of artists in my family on both sides. My mother's a potter. and one of the things that I was able to do living so close to New York City, you know, once I was old enough to take the commuter train line myself, uh, you know, I was able to take art classes in the city, 
you know, go to museums, go to hear music, just be pretty independent. So that was, that's mostly what I remember about, uh, you know, about my adolescence, especially. And it, it definitely led into my choice of college. I went to Sarah Lawrence College, which was uh-huh. very near to where I grew up. I wanted a small liberal arts school, but I wanted a school that was really strong in the arts. I wanted to study literature and economics and psychology, but I wanted to really make sure that I was still had great access to arts faculty. And I studied painting and printmaking. And quite frankly, I didn't want to leave New York. I still just really wanted to have access uh, to New York City, which really played into my choice of college. Like a lot of people of my generation, uh, I graduated from college in 2000. You know, there really wasn't much in the way of career services. I think my career office had a couple of people who worked there and they were very helpful, but, you know, it wasn't the kind of operation that you see today. And I left college totally unfocused, really kind of took a meandering path through most of my 20s career wise. I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Felt like I had some talents, but couldn't figure out how to apply them. And so I think I just made a decision to prioritize life experiences a lot more during that time. So I lived in Barcelona for a couple of years. I lived in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. It was, that was kind of a, a lark. I was supposed to be there for a few months, but ended up staying for a couple of years teaching English and uh, learning Spanish and just having a pretty great life in my early 20s. And then I lived in Los Angeles for several years as well before eventually landing back in New York. So I was about 29 when I finally made it back to New York after many years away. And it was in Los Angeles that I stumbled into what I think is the beginning of my real career path that I can kind of draw a through line to. I was working for a small retail company just as a, as a store manager while I kind of sorted out what I really wanted to do. And that company grew very, very quickly. And very quickly, I figured out and my bosses figured out that the thing that I was good at was the talent management, the interviewing people, hiring them, training them, troubleshooting. And then as the company was getting bigger and bigger, thinking more strategically about how do you take care of people? How do you have people grow and stay? How do you retain them in a company that's changing really quickly? So that became my role there. I was the HR director eventually. And they gave me a ton of responsibility really early on, uh, which was great, obviously, for my career, but it was really stressful. I was very, very stressed out. I was definitely in over my head. I wanted to do what I was doing, but I didn't really know how to do it. And so I was constantly researching like how to do my job and reading books and trying to self-educate. And while doing that, I stumbled onto something called organizational psychology, and recognized that that was really the meat of what I was excited to do in my job and that I couldn't believe that was a field. So for those who don't know, organizational psychology is taking a lot of psychology concepts, social psychology, ways that people interact, ways that people feel, you know, a few different disciplines in psychology, but applying it to organizations, how people work together, how people interact in groups. So group dynamics, you know, what makes people motivated and engaged in an organization and then issues of leadership and management. So, you know, Emily, I never told you this when we did our our sort of pre-meeting, but I I seriously looked at getting a master's in organizational psychology. You're kidding. No, I was really, really close to doing, I have an undergrad in psych. Okay. And then I was looking at like labor industrial relations, you know, which is, yeah, and all in that field. Well, so it's funny. Very few people know what it is. So I never told you that. I had to hold that back for today. <laughs> yeah, when I was telling friends that this was what I wanted to study, they would just make jokes like, oh, are you going to come over and look at my closets and tell me how crazy I am? It's you know, <laughs> really <laughs> not, not a well-known field. <laughs> yeah. So I discovered that Columbia University had a great program for it that was you know, very nearby. So um, I enrolled in grad school at Columbia for that, uh, starting when I was 31, I think is when I started. And I didn't want to pay for a master's degree. So I got a job in career services somewhere else in the university at their architecture school so that I could have free tuition. 
Oh, smart. Yeah, yeah. So I don't blame you trying to dodge Columbia's tuition. I don't blame you. <laughs> I know. You've got to be crafty. There were a lot of us working there and who were, you know, getting our master's degrees or doctorates at the same time. It was very, very common. So that's also something I feel like a lot of people don't know about. It's a little secret. But while I was doing it, I discovered that I loved working in higher ed. So it just all kind of combined. So by the time I graduated, you know, really realizing that career development in higher ed really addressed a lot of the things that I was excited to do. And then continued working at Columbia in executive education for a while, you know, changed jobs after I got my master's. And then five years ago, I uh, really wanted a lifestyle change. So I had a husband, I had a young son, and, and we really wanted to leave New York. And so an opportunity came up at Amherst College to lead their career center. And that was what I was really looking for, kind of a return to a small liberal arts college, you know, a move to a different location with an easier lifestyle. And so that's why we moved to Western Mass. Fantastic. Fantastic. That's great. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. The recommended resource for episode 97 is an eight-minute video that looks at the pros and cons of the three biggest MOOCs, Coursera, edX, and Udacity. Now, you will learn in this video how you can take free courses from professors from places like Cal Berkeley, MIT, and Harvard. You will also learn how you can get certificates that you can add to your resume. You will learn about nano degrees that are offered through these MOOCs and how you can get a new skill to help you enter into a new field in the job market. And you will learn about their capstone projects that are available to you. Now, our podcast listeners are a very special group. You all have an insatiable love of learning, and I can see you loving the offerings from these three leading MOOCs. We will put the link in your show notes so you can learn how these MOOCs can help you take your learning and your skill sets to a whole new level. Now return to my interview with Emily Griffin. So that's a perfect segue to our topic of the day, which is how can a student, how can a parent, how can anybody listening, a college counselor, evaluate and fully utilize a college's career center? Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts? Well, it's pretty much all I think about. So I have a lot of thoughts. Um, so why don't we start with the basic? You know, let's start with the basics. Yeah. What, what services do college career centers provide? Yeah. I mean, the basics for any career center are going to be both student facing and, and employer facing. You know, that's basically the setup for students. Now you're talking tech talk with the facing word there. So break it down for us. Got it. You got it. So there are staff and career centers that focus on working directly with students in terms of helping them with job search, Mm -hmm. how to create a resume, how to prep for interviews. That's very tactical. They also will do reflective work, um, helping students sort through interests, values, where they're coming from, you know, what they hope to do in the future, make connections between what they're studying and what's out there on the ground in the real world. Mm -hmm. Um, And and overall, do some planning for those first steps. So that's the student-facing piece of Mm -hmm. a career center operation. And then, you know, the other piece works on relationship building with employers and often alumni. And of course, those groups really overlap. Um, and a lot of schools, which is kind of what you want. So different centers have different approaches to how they do it, you know, do either bit of those pieces of the operation, but th- those are the nuts and bolts of what a career center handles pretty much anywhere. That's sounding really fun, to be honest. It's sounding fun. <laughs> like a, yeah. So on the uh, employer facing, I'm assuming that would involve things like trying to convince employers to come to your campus to yeah. either do interviews or to do internships and does part of it also involve sort of making the case for what your graduates bring to the table? Or is there, is there that component in it or not really? Yeah, definitely. You know, any career center uh, director and certainly any of the staff that work on employer relations have to understand the value proposition for their students in particular. 
They have to know what differentiates them from students maybe coming from very similar schools. Sometimes there's not a ton that differentiates them and it's, but what is that profile of students? What have they done before that can help, you know, tell the story of, of what organizations can expect from them? So there's a bit of that sales aspect mm-hmm. to that side of the role for sure. And with alumni, is that sort of tapping into your alumni network and saying, listen, wouldn't you, you know, looking at who's in, in, in a ownership capacity, you're not even in ownership capacity. It could be anything, right? You could have doctors yes. for shadow days and things like that, or writers. And is it trying to utilize them both for internships as well as for potential permanent hires? I mean, I, how does it work yes. on the alumni side? Yeah, I mean, that's what makes the employer relations work most successful. That That is um, how strong your relationships are with alumni. And so, you know, thinking about different schools and what assets they have to support their students, I really think that the engagement level and devotion of the alumni body is one of your best indicators of how many resources are coming the way of students who are enrolled. And a good career center will optimize those relationships. So there are some colleges that actually will keep that a little bit separate, that will not want career centers getting so involved in Mm. relationships with alumni. It's, you know, the alumni relations are really owned by you know, development, by Mm -hmm. alumni engagement functions. And that's a real miss. That's really Mm short-sighted. The colleges that collaborate can bring so much more to their students because alumni, they feel loyal. They understand what they got from the education that they have, and they want to typically bring other students from their alma mater into their workplaces. Mm -hmm. It's kind of natural. It's kind of human nature if they had a good experience at the college that they went to. And so, you know, pulling on that is really the most successful strategy for finding new employers. And, you know, and it also, like we mentioned, there's the sales aspect of explaining what your students bring to the table. When you're having a conversation with an alum from your institution, you can skip five steps of that conversation. I mean, they Mm -hmm. get it. Mm -hmm. They're as excited to talk to you as you are to them. So it really speeds that up and they'll go to bat for you, you know, in their organization to make sure that students have access to the opportunities that are available. So I'm finding this fascinating, probably because I've got an organizational psychology inquisitiveness bone in my body. But exactly. uh, (laughs) So about to serve some of the services that you listed are. Yeah, there's some that are just kind of standard that pretty much all career centers have and others that are more deluxe that more icing on the cake that maybe the, if you were evaluating ones, like the best of the best career centers do? Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Aside from really looking for evidence that alumni are bringing what they have to the table and that they're really engaged and involved and getting engaged with the career center. So that's, I would say, is the number one thing to look for Mm. in judging how effective a career center is. But Aside from that, the better resourced career centers are the ones that have been able to expand beyond just generalist kind of reference librarian type career advising. There's nothing wrong with that. I was trained that way. I was trained as a general coach with a general kind of toolkit in how to Mm -hmm. coach anyone on any topic, you know, from reflection to action steps. and, And that's really valuable. But the better career centers in terms of resources have been able to bring on advisors who specialize, who not just are able to conduct those conversations with students and help them make connections, but they actually have expertise mm. in the field that a student is interested in. So oh, wow. a lot of schools will have a pre-law advisor and like a medical school advisor, because those are really specific grad school destinations where you need specific information and planning in order to apply successfully. But now schools are starting to add more dimensions to that. So for instance, at Amherst, we have an advisor dedicated to careers in arts and communication. We have one dedicated to education careers. We have one dedicated you know, to science and technology, one dedicated to business and finance. So those types of industry cluster advisors, I would say that that's the vanguard of really good career centers and, and what kind of 
staff they're able to have. And, and that's not to say the career centers who don't have those kinds of advising models, you know, that they're not talented or they don't know what they're doing. It's really a matter of resources. It's a matter of, you know, is the college investing in additional staff positions for the career center? Is our alumni contributing, you know, are they donating to create new programs and positions for the career center? It's kind of a a resource war, (laughs) but it really makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference to have that specialized advising. And then the other thing that is really critical is support for internships. Internships are more important than ever. They're the most valuable vehicle for professional development in many respects. It's in terms of understanding what your interests are, what kind of work you like and don't like. It's kind of hard to just do that in a conversation. It's really great to have a boots on the ground experience in a real workplace. You also can develop skills that are directly relevant to a particular field and you can build a professional network. So they're super important. And employers now, you know, when they're looking at a student, a senior, you know, considering to hire them, they still look at GPA, but much, much more, they look at what is their previous work experience, what have been their internships, in addition to activities on campus. And so it's important to not just have internships, but to have at least a couple of them during your time in college to be as competitive as possible. So a career center that is really adequately resourced really needs to have some way of helping students find those internships, helping them make meaning out of what they've learned from them. And a lot of internships are unpaid. Most internships are unpaid. And so schools with more infrastructure around internships will often have funding programs. So if you get an unpaid internship, you can apply for a stipend from the college or from the career center that helps you defray some of your expenses. It doesn't, you know, pay you fairly or replace a wage, but at least allows you to get housing and meals and accept that unpaid internship which takes a lot of financial pressure off of families. Hey, the pay is the 40-year career that it helps launch. (laughs) That's, you know, it's delayed. The pay is delayed. Exactly, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) I'm really glad you mentioned sort of pre-law, pre-med, all that, because I think a lot of times when people think of career centers, they're just strictly thinking about the job force. But what percentage of the work you do is on the grad placement side of things? Yeah. Or professional schools? Yeah, professional schools are a little bit different. I mean. Most law schools, I would say many law schools and nearly all business schools now really like to see some work experience. So I think 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there were a lot more students going straight into law school, straight into med school, straight into business school after graduating from college. And now it's much, much more common that students are taking a couple of years, at least a couple of years before doing that. And so career centers are actually working with young alumni more than current students in terms of preparing students for professional schools, doing mock interviews, helping them, you know, get their ducks in a row in terms of their personal statement and taking exams and things like that. In terms of academic graduate school, I still think that the expertise for academic graduate programs, so PhD programs, you know, in the sciences or in the humanities, that expertise is still really going to come from faculty. Mm -hmm. At Amherst, we certainly work with students kind of as project managers on that, just making sure that, especially for first-generation college students who might not have people in their family who've gone to college or gone to grad school, to make sure that, you know, okay, you know the checkboxes, you know the timelines, you know certain rules of the road, you know, around how important it is to cultivate relationships with faculty, for instance, because then you're going to be asking them for letters of recommendation. So there are those kinds of, that kind of advising that we do with students around grad school, but a lot of the academic programs, I think most of the advising lift is still coming from faculty. You know, I have to share a story. One of my favorite students, she's now 34, I worked with her and she went to Swarthmore College and visited, went to her graduation. She got the top student award at Swarthmore and she wanted to go to Columbia Law. And Columbia basically said, go get some work experience. So she did like an yeah. empowerment zone in like West Philly. Then she went to Columbia mm. for law school and now she's like one of Starbucks top patent attorneys. So mm. pretty, pretty cool story. So yeah, so I think 
that's probably been around for some time, right? One of the professional sure. schools wanting you to have some yep. like real work experience. Definitely. Next week in the news, college admissions hysteria is not the norm. And we'll be in chapter 98 of 171 Answers. And we'll be talking about why the EFC can sometimes say that families need to pay an outrageous amount of money. And next week's question asks if there's an advantage to kids attending boarding schools as it relates to applying to college. And Mark continues his interview with Emily Griffin and how you can evaluate and fully utilize a college's career center, part two. Okay, friends, our call spotlight today is Seton Hall University. Uh, very excited to learn a lot about Seton Hall. The meeting I had with the representative this fall, it came through. Underrated school that flies under the radar. It's not on a lot of lists. It should be on more lists. I have one student I'm working with in Boston who visited and just fell in love this year. But a little bit about Seton Hall. So it's only 14 miles from New York City. So it's in South Orange, New Jersey. So one of the nice things that you get is you get access to New York and you get access to Newark, New Jersey. And so it is a school that has 17,000 internships because it takes advantage of Newark being there and New York being there. It is founded in 1856. It's Catholic and it's proud of its Catholic heritage. They have 90 different academic programs. They have uh, 10,200 students, but 6,200 undergrads and 4,000 grads. So it's nice because it's not really, really small, but it's also not super big. So it's 6,200 is enough, um, you know, good size for you to get a lot of individual attention, but yet not still have a lot of courses to pick from and a lot of friends to pick from. It's a fully gated community, 55% female, 45% male. And it's, the campus is tight and small. It's only on 58 acres. Well, you know, you can understand that's prime real estate, that North Jersey area. So it's a tight campus, but once again, safe, fully gated community. It's a school that's generous with its merit scholarship. So it's a $59,000 cost of attendance, but every student is pretty much going to get between four and 24,000 in merit scholarships. Now, most of the time, you're going to have to do a separate application, except for their university scholarship. That's the only one that your admission application counts as your merit application. Mostly, you're going to have to do separate applications for them. It's a school that can take a wide range of kids. Here, let me give you the actual numbers. So 31% of students have a grade point average over 3.75, but 14% are under 3.0. And also, when you look at the ACT, uh, 60% of the kids would be between a 24 and a 29 on the ACT, but 6% over 30, and one-third would be between an 18 and a 23. 39% of students live on campus, and they have some pretty cool traditions there. One of the traditions that I really like is because they were founded in 1856, they take the first 56 days of the fall and they do a big special event for all 56 days. Like one day is like a fall festival. Then another day is like an ice cream social. I think that's pretty cool. They have a big focus on student success. They really dedicate a lot of resources to the career center there. So there's some professors that require students to go to the career center twice a week as an assignment. Wow. Yeah, twice a week. You know, you don't hear that that often. They give everybody both a peer advisor and an academic advisor. Uh, it's a very diverse school. 48% white, 17% Latinx, 14% black, 9% Asian. So real mix, the full rainbows there in the population. And obviously it is an urban campus, as we mentioned before. And being really close to Newark, uh, I used to travel in this area all the time. Like I take four trips there a year. And I know this area really, really well. I can picture these buildings. They're not far from like the Prudential buildings. But Prudential has a huge presence in Newark, New Jersey. And so does Allstate. So they have massive internships with both in Newark, tying into those type of companies. But New York City, they're close enough to New York City that they tap into that. Now, let's talk about some of their really, really strong majors. Business, for sure. Finance, very strong. Accounting, very strong. Marketing, really strong. They have a really strong major called Labor and Industrial Relations, which is in their business school. That's a very strong program. They have a really strong multidisciplinary leadership program that's really creative. You meet with CEOs and VPs and they go through the seven pillars of leadership. That's a really strong program. And another program that's very strong are their dual degree health programs. So they have their, their School of Health and Medical Sciences. They have a lot of dual degrees, meaning 
you're getting your bachelor's and your master's, or you're getting your bachelor's and your doctorate. Mm. And you save time with those accelerator programs. And so they have a really strong physician assistant dual degree program. They have a physical therapy program that's really strong. They also have a speech language and pathology program, an athletic training program, and an occupational therapy program. And nursing is very good there. They've got a really good BSN. I refer them quite a bit to my nursing students as well. So they're really putting a lot of money right now into the health sciences. They just took over this pharmaceutical building and dumped about $40 million into it. And they have a separate campus, actually, for all their health services. So there are 23 different Greek organizations, took over this pharmaceutical building and dumped about $40 million into it. And they have a separate campus, actually, for all their health services. So there are 23 different Greek organizations, you know, that are there on campus. They accept about seven in 10 kids who apply. They offer Division I sports, but they're best known for their men's basketball. They overlap a lot with Rutgers University for their applicants. And one of their famous alum is ESPN broadcaster Dick Vitale. Arguably, they are best known for their outstanding law school. And, you know, it is a strong commitment to Catholic education, but um, it's a really good place. What do you think, Anika? Well, beyond me trying to wrap my mind around a fully gated 58-acre community. <laughs> <laughs> I lost you on that argument. It sounds amazing. I love it. I love it. Close to New York. Well, I think that what's unique about them is one, their location. Like California is one of their biggest states, you know, and a lot of people like to be near New York City. They just do, okay. right? To be 14 miles from New York City right. and to be plugged into all of those. And so they can accept a range of students, but the size of the school, you know, I think that they have a lot to offer. And I find that they really fly under the radar because even when I talk to my Pennsylvania, my New Jersey families, a lot of times they don't know all that Seton Hall is doing. Oh, there's something I didn't talk about that I should talk about. I'm so glad I remembered it. They have another really strong program, Anika, that I never commented on. And I just remember it because I referred somebody this year for this program. So they're doing some really, really great things when it comes to international relations. Hmm. International relations and political science. That's a very strong program that they have. They have a school of diplomacy. There's actually two schools. They have their school of diplomacy and international relations. That's one track. And they have a whole semester in D.C. Hmm. with that which is, you know, great. You can go spend it in D.C. And then they have another program. It's like diplomacy and law. It focuses on, diplo- you know, it focuses on diplomacy and law. So, yeah, so they're doing a lot for people that are interested in both international relations and political science. So I would have been remiss to not give them their due for that. Mm, Excellent. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. And if you found this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that could really use this information. Your College Bound Kid is produced by John Lockenball. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Artwork is by Andrea Togo. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. If you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like for us to answer on the show, please email us at questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. That's questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions, so send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, which is just simply yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in, and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.